Again, I thank you, and I will prove my thanks. I have heard, no matter how, that there is a man who dare speak slightingly of ye, whose shoelace he is not fit to tie. I have, as I told ye, a little power for my studies, and I will deliver him into your hands, to do with him whatsoever ye will. But tell me, ye speak thus, are ye truly a man as, as ye seem, or what are ye? Eh, sweetheart, truly a man, and a man to love ye, for a, for a, a sooth, never have I seen a seen woman worthier to be loved. Dost doubt me? His arm was around her as he drew her gently through the door into the courtyard of the ruin. Nay, I doubt ye not, but ye are so strong, so great, ye are too great almost for man, not too great to be thy humble slave. All the greatness that the greatest of us men can achieve is nothing to the magic of a beautiful woman, and you are beautiful, sweetheart, and if I am strong, it is but to provide a setting worthy of such a rich jewel. He drew her toward, towards his rich bed of golden brackens in the corner of the courtyard. Still art thou timid, sweetheart? Nay, I love thee all the more. See, I am but a man, humble to be thee, humble to thee. Thou art my queen, let me worship thee. With his left hand he swept back the hood from her head and stroked the rich, luxuriant hair that loosened from the snood she had once, put, once more put on, flowed wildly over the green bodice. With a gentle pressure, he turned her head upwards toward, towards him and gazed into the great dark eyes. She looked into his piercingly bright ones, and it seemed as, th as though all were gradually oozed away from her. And there and therewith all memory and consciousness of everything save only herself and him, the past and the future were gone, non-existent, the castle itself was gone. They were in some great hall hung with trophies and splendid ornaments, and in one corner was a heap of wondrous cushions spread with oriental robes and sil silken coverings of orange and scarlet and amber. And all the time those marvellous eyes were searching hers, and it seemed as if the whole of his being were dominating her, till she knew and desired nothing else in all the earth. Her head lay on his shoulder, her face upturned to his as she received his long, sweet, shuddering kiss on her lips, and closed her eyes in ecstasy and bliss. Then he drew her to the corner, to the pile of cushions that made a sort of divan, and it seemed to her as though all material thing, things melted and dissolved. She was floating in a golden haze without sense, without volition. Then consciousness itself faded, and she knew no more. A cold breeze on her forehead roused her, and she opened her eyes slowly. She felt some hard, rough substance under her arms. She looked out on the familiar suitors of Cromarty, she was leaning over a wall beside a gate on the road from Albany to Loch Loy. She had been asleep then. But how had she come here? She had no knowledge at all. She had no recollection of walking out. She had had a headache and had not gone to Kirk. She must have wandered about in her sleep and just wakened here. As she wondered, she heard voices. The folk were coming back from the Kirk. She stood beside the gate and several passed by twos and threes. Then John Gilbert came along, walking alone. Moved by some sudden impulse, she stepped out into the road and walked along beside him, thinking to tell him that her headache was better, and she had come out to take the air and to meet him. Then he turned round and said, Was it not that a fine discourse we had the day from Mrs. Mr. F Mr. Forbes? Indeed, I am right glad you were there. Chapter 5 The Sickness of the Laird of Park's Son In looking over my great-great-great-grandfather's papers and other records of the time, I find frequent references to a strange sickness that att attacked many persons with no ostensible cause somewhat of a kind that would now be termed an epidemic. Mr. Patrick's father, 
the worthy Robert Innes, who was a distinguished surgeon of Aberdeen, gave it a learned name, compounded of equal parts of Greek and Latin, but he had to confess his inability to cure it. The common pe people called it the wasting sickness. True to the tra traditions of his cloth, Mr. Patrick ascribed it to the direct malice of the devil, allowed to vex the elect on account of the, the decay of faith and disloyalty of the people of Scotland and, and to, the, to the purity and doctrines of the reformed Kirk. And it seems that the Catholic priest of Deathtown, who with his tiny congregation had by some curious inadvertence been entirely forgotten and passed over by the godly reformers, and continued to say his mass continually without molestation, while he, agreeing with Mr. Patrick as to the agency of the devil, ascribed his power to hurt to the spread of the doctrines of that very reformed Kirk. Whereat, said Sir Robert Gordon, the devil may have laughed in his sleeve at them both. But whatever may have been the cause, there is no doubt that the sickness was greatly dreaded among the common folk, and indeed among the gentry also, for it spared no class and was nearly always fatal. Isabel Goody, looking back towards the old castle, which now seemed to her almost like a holy place, where a new life had dawned on for her, a life of joy and power, of love and gladness, where a lover had come to her such as surely mortal woman had ever known before, saw some boys running towards the castle, the foremost of them being the eldest son of the Laird of Park. She heard their shouts and their talk, and her hatred of the family blazed strong in her brain. Tomorrow I'll climb that old wall, cried young Hay. You dare not, said one of his companions. I better dare, and I'll fling down some of the stones and scare the bats and owls, I warrant ye. Isabel felt a bitter resentment, much as a papist might feel hearing a sacrilegious proposal to, to desecrate the altar. That place had been consecrated by that wonderful meeting with the Dark Master. It was intolerable intoler that riotous boys should destroy the beautiful associations and trample on her romance, above, above all such a boy as that. May he never have male issue to come after him. She recalled the wish so often uttered. Her brain was boiling with indignation. As she could love, so she could hate with the intensity and concentration that carried away her away in a resistless tide. Oh, may the wasting sickness seize him, she muttered, and instantly she was calm. The paroxysm of anger had passed. Gilbert at her side knew nothing of it, but continued to speak slowly and heavily of the sermon of the folk who had been at the kirk, and regretfully of the small amount in the plate. She scarcely heeded. Her mind was going back o over all the incidents of her meeting with the Dark Master in the ruined castle. It was not ruined, though. It was a splendid hall. Not even the Earl of Moray in his fine castle of Darnaway had such a hall. And how she and the Master had lain there in each other's arms on a couch of oriental magnificence. This was her des destiny, her rightful position. Only she grieved that she had lost consciousness. She had floated away in a delicious dream. But she had missed some moments, some hours mayhap, of that wonderful time, every moment of which was precious to her. He had praised her Greek gown, he had admired her, the way her hair lay on it, and he had stroked her hair with that thrilling touch of his. Stay, what of that gown? How in the world had Gilbert not asked about it? How could he tolerate her going abroad in such finery as he so often condemned and would never permit her to wear? She looked down in apprehension, which turned, turned to amazed wonder, for she had on the old homespun gown, and laying in her hand on her bosom, she could feel the little golden crucifix sewn therein. Had she then dreamed all that meeting in the wards of Insock? No, ten thousand times. If that were a dream, then perish all earthly things. 
there was nothing in all the world worth living for. Sooner than give over that one experience as an actual palpable reality, she would give herself and her soul's salvation. Yea, let everything else be a lie, but let that one thing be true. That afternoon, as is usual with most God-fearing members of the Kirk, on the Sabbath, John Gilbert spread himself on the settee by the kitchen fire and slept audibly. Isabel walked to the edge of the uh, dreary lock and looked across the still waters to the Firth and the distant shores of Cromarty and Sutherland, lying very clearly clear and defined in softest t tones of grey and blue and pearl under the declining sun. But it was no longer dreary to her. On the contrary, it was irradiated with a magic light. Romans had come to her at last and the fulfilment of her dreams. For one fleeting moment, the memory of marriage vows recurred to her, only to be instantly dismissed. The church wherein she was brought up would acknowledge none such. In the eyes of the priest at Dufftown, her marriage was no marriage at all. What mattered it, what the Kirk might say? She had renounced her baptism therein, she was no longer a member of that kirk. But with her baptism in the Catholic Church, the dark master himself said he had nothing to do. Then had John Gilbert ever been her husband? She was but his chattel, bought and sold. Nay, she would not be a chattel. She refused to be bought. She belonged to herself. No human being can be bought thus in free Scotland. Belonging to herself, she gave herself willingly, gladly, to a lover worthy of her. All of which, it must be admitted, was a very specious argument, though untenable. But her heart went with it, and her heart was most a most powerful advocate whose success she desired. All the same, mysteries surrounded her. What was real and what was dream or fancy, she could not disentangle the events. She seemed to be perfectly solidly in the kirk of Alderney, and there had been an actual material storm, yet she had come home without a speck of mud or wet. She had not the slightest doubt that she was bodily in the old castle at Insock, when she met the dark master that very morning in the green gown, which, by the way, she had not known that she possessed, and the black hood. Yet she had come home in the old homespun dress without the smallest chance of changing. If some things were dream, others were real, and there was no distinguishing which was which. Yet the very uncertainty seemed to add to the fascination of the position. If it was a puzzle, it was a delightful one. She and her lover would solve it together. Her lover, dare she call him so, even to her inmost heart. It was a wild, delicious thrill to use the term at any rate. She would not forgo that. Her lover, her lover, she repeated the words with glad reiteration of pride. A while she wandered along the banks of the loch. Then she turned and went in. Strange dreams came to her that night. She was by the kirk of Alderney, just within the kirkyard wall. Some women were in the kirkyard. At least she thought they were women by their dress, but they were very dimly seen, and who they were she could not determine. Vague shadowy figures they were. At one corner of the kirkyard, the brown earth was heaped over a newly made grave. Round this spectral, figures gathered. She seemed to remember that an unchristened child had been buried there. The figures began to dig the new, newly turned earth. She watched, horrified but fascinated. She knew in her dream that they would disinter the child's body. Something of this she had read. Presently, one of the spectres, leaping down into the grave, lifted out the little coffin, and the others gathering round seemed to to prise off the coffin lid. As usually ch ch chances in a dream, 
All sense of right and wrong, all sense of horror or disgust seemed to have left her. The most unnatural and abominable, abominable things seemed unaccountably natural and of course. She tried to see, but the crowding phantoms prevented her. Yet by a strange ins instinct in her dream, she knew what they were doing. They were cutting the heart out of the little body, and then replacing it in the coffin, which was lowered again into the grave and covered up. Meantime, the heart was placed in an earthenware vessel, and the evil congregation separated hither and thither, some seemingly collecting various grasses and herbs, others bringing earth from different places. She could now see more clearly how two foul and evil-looking women bent over the vessel that held the heart of the child. One of them clipping locks of her own grizzled and matted hair, which she snipped up into little pieces, while the other prepared her nails and scattered the parings into the vessel. The others now returned with the things they had collected and threw them all into the pot, and two commenced to pound and the contents with heavy sticks, the whole company chanting a kind of dirge that sounded more like the baying of dogs than anything human. Then a rush of darkness swept over everything, a suffocating cloud in which she gasped for breath. The nightmare oppression passed and she did not wake. Now she was near to the wards of Insop, 